Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to kindly ask you to take your seats, please, uh, here on site in, in Brisbane. And uh, certainly, I would like to welcome everyone who have joined us online. I see a number of members of parliament present online coming from different regions, not just Asia Pacific. And uh, I especially would like to thank them because I do understand that the time zone is very challenging for those uh, connecting from especially Europe and Africa. And with that, we will start just now. First of all, uh, this is the second day of the parliamentary track that we uh, are organizing in cooperation with the Asia Pacific IGF, with the government of Australia, uh, also with support from AUDA. And I once again would like to thank all those partners for helping us to make this uh, uh, vision a reality. The past couple of days, we've heard very interesting discussions, and I hope that today that trend will continue. We're certainly continuing on a very interesting topic uh, with very interesting uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I just would like to announce that our focus today really will be on building trust in digital environment, something that seems to be very fragile. Uh, but the good thing is that it, it seems that this community is very much aware of the importance of that concept and works hard to understand where the issues are and more importantly, uh, what could be the ways forward to remedy that. In preparing for the 18th annual IGF in Kyoto, which is coming very soon in more than just a little bit more than a month from 8 to 12 of October, we will be setting the scene here, building a foundation at the Asia Pacific Regional IGF to understand what's the role of parliamentarians in internet governance. And then you may know that we will continue this journey also through the African IGF, engaging with um, parliamentarians from around the world, but being at the African IGF in Abuja, Nigeria, which comes very um, soon in September. With that, I would like to invite um, the speakers of today's panel to join me on this stage. Uh, first of all, Excellency Mr. Brendan Downling, Australia's Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology. We will also have Ms. Um, Lea Poali Unutua Auleu Fonti, Chief Executive Officer, Ministry of Communication and Information Technology of Samoa. And Ms. Joyce Chen, Senior Advisor, Strategic Engagement with APNIC. I hope you can join me uh, here on this stage. And I want to thank you on behalf of the Secretariat, but all the partners organizing this track for accepting to open today's uh, series of discussions. While the speakers are joining me, uh, as I said, we are preparing for the IGF in Japan. I think we're entering a finishing phase of uh, the very intensive preparations and the parliamentary track will have quite a robust structure also in Kyoto. And on that note, I think it would be nice to and important that we start this session with the message coming directly from Japan. Uh, and I'm going to ask our colleagues uh, in the back, uh, and certainly thank you for all the support so far, to prepare a pre-recorded statement uh, from uh, Ms. Kunimitsu Ayano, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan, also a member of the Japanese Parliament. If you could play the message, please. Thank you. Honora. Parliament members, executive officers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kunimitsu Ayano, Parliamentary Vice Minister for International Affairs and Communication of Japan. It is a great pleasure and an honor to me to say a few words on behalf of the Japanese government. First, I'd like to send congratulations to the members of the Asia Pacific regional IZF and the host for your successful meeting. We are pleased to be host country of Global IGF this October, which will give us an opportunity to promote an open, free, and reliable internet with multi-stakeholder approach. 
in parliamentary drafts this year, the key theme will be the role of parliamentarians in shaping digital trust. We are planning to discuss three areas which are important for global society. And they are first, data governance, second, artificial intelligence AI, and third, disinformation. These topics were also discussed at the G7 Digital Tech Ministers meeting, Japan, hosted this year. The discussion covered more how to ensure reliable connectivity while addressing global digital divide and how to achieve interoperability among AI governance frameworks based on shared democratic values. In particular, on AI, G7 leaders tasked the ministers to establish Hiroshima AI process to report on generative AI. I'm confident that IGF 223 will be a valuable opportunity for this process to listen to opinions from wider range of stakeholders. We are planning to hold special sessions to promote Hiroshima AI process, and we'd like it to be happy if you are interested. I look forward to further discussion of these important topics with you in Kyoto. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, to, to Vice Minister for this important message. And I think we can now move uh, to this room. Um, I would like to ask our panelists to help us set the stage. And then I'm especially going to ask you to prepare yourself for um, engaging with, um, with the panelists and also among ourselves with questions and comments on this very important topic. Um, primarily, I would like us to focus on what is the current situation in the Asia Pacific region specifically, but certainly globally as well. Um, as we witness the increasing lack of public trust around concept of uh, privacy, security, consumer, consumer prote protection, but also human rights. What are the main challenges that policymakers face to help shape a trustworthy digital uh, space in the region? And then especially how can members of parliaments as legislators benefit from the mechanisms such as the regional IGF or the global IGF, the national IGFs especially. Uh, and it would be wonderful to hear also what is the perspective that we also have in terms of the expectations of us from members of parliaments, but also of parliaments uh, speaking for, from, from the side of um, us. In that sense, I would like maybe to ask uh, Ambassador Downlink to open this session with a couple of opening remarks. I think um, I'll stay sitting. Seems a bit more relaxed, um, particularly as we uh, hope to have a bit of a discussion and hear questions or comments from um, those in the room or online. Uh, so I'm Brendan Dowling, I'm Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology. And part of the reason why Australia established an ambassadorial role with the focus on digital technologies, uh, technology security, cyber security back in 2016 is to recognize that it's crucial that governments have a voice in how technology is being developed and deployed and how it's being designed so that it meets the expectations of our consumers for being able to use digital technologies in a safe and secure way. So it's really important that we have these types of gatherings, that we have uh, the types of people we have in the room and online who have a role in shaping what regulation looks like in the digital era, but who also engage with a really strong and vibrant multi-stakeholder community to ensure that that uh, policies and regulations are designed with many voices having had the opportunity to input uh, and shape it. The theme of this morning's discussion is really about trust in the digital age. And I think uh, that's the pivotal concept that it's worth us spending a, a bit of time talking about. When we talk about trust, we're talking about how people feel engaging online 
in a myriad of ways, whether it's in their professional lives, in their social lives, uh, in their cultural lives, in a way that they can feel confident that they're doing so in a safe environment where their privacy is respected, where their information is secure, and where that uh, they can feel that they have control and agency about how they participate and how their information uh, is accessed, utilised, bought, sold, uh, in a way that's consistent with their rights, their privacy and their expectations. That conversation about trust flows across the future of the internet and internet governance, it flows across online safety issues and it flows across cyber security. It's really clear to me in this region that a really preeminent concern that people have is activities like scams uh, online, cyber security, uh, malware, ransomware, uh, disinformation and how they can trust the information that they access uh, online and online safety issues. We've seen things like the prevalence of cyberbullying about uh, content that is harmful being easily accessed uh, and propagated online. I think it's worth talking about the experience in Australia, Australia last year around the incidents that affected Optus our second biggest telecommunications firm, and Medibank, our largest private health insurance provider, because both those incidents really went to the question of trust. So within the space of a few weeks, uh, more than 10 million Australians had their information compromised online through one or both of those incidents. Uh, People saw in the Optus incident that their passport information, their driver's license, their bank details were all potentially available to malicious actors. In the Medibank incident, it was even more alarming. Not only was there that type of personally identifiable, identifying information, but there was very sensitive health and medical information that had been accessed by a cyber criminal who uh, the Australian government has identified as operating out of Russia. Uh, and uh, my experience working on those incidents at the time was that every morning I would wake up at around 6 a.m. and I would grab my phone while I was still in bed to check on what had been released by the cyber criminal overnight. And for a series of mornings, what we saw was that he was releasing uh, packages of information that held the most sensitive information about the Australian citizens uh, and others who were concerned. This was information relating to people who were seeking health treatment, um, sometimes for very sensitive conditions, sometimes very private conditions, sometimes for things that they might not have shared with their family members. Um, there were prominent people, politicians and celebrities caught up in this. And every morning there was that sense of dread and terror about what might be released as part of the disclosure of that information. Now, for me, I was coming at it from a government coordination perspective. How do we protect people uh, who were uh, affected by this breach? I, I wasn't personally a Medibank customer, so there wasn't a personal risk uh, involved for me, but many of my colleagues were. So while we were working this incident, while we we're looking at the impacts across Australian society, there are also many people within government who knew that their information had been caught up in either of these two incidents and had that sense of alarm about how they might personally be affected. For the Australian community, I think you cannot underestimate how important these incidents were for trust in the online environment. You suddenly had cybersecurity, malware, ransomware being discussed around the kitchen table, uh, in social settings, at bars and pubs, at church groups. Everyone was talking about these incidents because so many people were affected. And there was a lot of direct implications in terms of those that information being compromised, but the, the longer and more important implication was the undermining of trust in the digital environment. People were asking, hold on a second, I've shared my information, I've trusted that these companies were able to secure it, and that trust has been breached. How else can it be breached? How else can, uh, what other companies or what other government agencies um, can uh, be compromised in this way? Should I be sharing my information online? Should I be accessing these services online? And the, the, the massive risk for us through those incidents was that 
people would disengage. And as we pursue a digital economy agenda, where more and more businesses are taking advantage of the opportunities that the digital domain represents, um, the commercial opportunities it represents, the better customer service that it represents, as more and more government agencies are moving their services online, because that's what people expect. They expect to be able to access government services online in a quick and easy way. If we saw that undermining of trust, then people would be less willing uh, to engage in that way. So the real cost is then that we don't have people confident to engage online. That's an example that we're seeing played out across this region. And in many ways, it's being played out through things like scam activity, where people are increasingly conscious that their banking information, that the messages they receive on their phone through WhatsApp um, might be compromised, might be coming from a malicious actor. And all of that goes to undermine uh, the trust in the digital environment. Rightfully, we are now looking at how we can develop ways to preserve and build that trust. And this means governments like Australia's and governments throughout the region are looking at ways that we can give our citizens the confidence that engaging online is a safe and secure place to be. You've seen the Australian government uh, under, enact a range of measures over the last uh, few years, including increasing cyber security obligations on critical infrastructure, including measures to hold social media platforms accountable for the content that they have online, particularly when it comes to child abuse material or when it comes to terrorist content online. And now the Australian government is looking at how we can more effectively deal with the issue of disinformation online, which threatens no less than to undermine the democratic integrity of the way our country uh, operates. So it is right that parliaments and governments, the region over are looking for ways to ensure that safety and security online is prioritised. I think the important thing for me is that we do that in a way that's balanced. If we do it the wrong way, if we overcorrect, we do risk setting up walled gardens around the world that undermine the interoperability of the digital domain. We've talked a lot about internet governance. Uh, the fragmentation of the internet, I think, is a real prospect if governments overreach and go too far in saying we will have effectively sovereign borders around the internet. Now, that's not to say that governments shouldn't be trying to find ways to improve the safety and security of their citizens participating online. It's not only uh, important that we do that, but it's also a democratic responsibility. If that's what the community is expecting, the governments need to find ways to respond. However, if that needs to be done in a way that's careful and that's balanced, otherwise we do risk undermining the very interoperability of the internet, particularly if we get into the game of uh, uh, interfering with how data is uh, transferred and transmitted globally. Um, if we look at the very architecture of how people access the internet, if we look at things like internet shutdowns in locations or around certain timing, those sort of things can undermine the way that the internet uh, operates uh, globally. So for me, this is an agenda which policymakers are wrestling with uh, all over the region and all over the globe. And we're looking at ways that we can find, uh, that we can improve that safety and security online. We're looking at ways to hold digital platforms and technology companies accountable. And I think there's a lot to be done there. I think you've seen Australia, as I said, enact legislation that introduces greater accountability, particularly on social media platforms. As we develop our new cyber security strategy to be released in coming months, you will see the Australian government talk about expecting and requiring security by design in digital services and hardware, which is to say that companies should prioritise the cyber security, the safety of their devices, of their software before they come to market so that there's less onus on the end user to figure out that there's a malicious scam coming through or the domain name they're accessing uh, has malicious uh, content um, or uh, coding on it. So we are trying to find ways 
to increase the obligations of industry and companies in the digital domain, from software companies to hardware companies to telecommunication services, to find ways to help us build that confidence that people can participate safely uh, online. But at the same time, the critical thing is doing that in a way that is balanced, that's transparent, that's subject to the rule of law and legislation that comes through parliaments with the accountability and the review that that brings, and that it's co-designed with industry. Many of the things that Australia has done uh, in recent years have effectively been saying to industry, here's the objective that we want you to meet. Now you figure out how to do it. We're not going to prescribe to you exactly how you do it because you know your technology better than us. You know your platforms better than us. And so we want to give you the flexibility and the scope to design things that work in ways that are consistent with the great innovation, the great products that you have brought to market. Uh, and we will not get in the game of being overly prescriptive about how these things uh, should work. The concepts of safety by design or security by design are really critical here. What both those concepts say is not that we're going to tell you how to design safe and secure products, but that we're going to say, you must prioritize safety and security in the design of your products from the outset. That this is not an optional add-on, that this is not something you bolt on after the fact, that this is not something that's just a sort of additional extra that you might think about later on in the piece while you prioritize functionality and speed to market, that you should be thinking about those concepts in the design of all your technologies. So for me, that's a crucial point as parliaments and policymakers look at this. We need to be careful that we don't overcorrect, that we don't come down too hard in a way that has consequences for how our people can access technology, or that has consequences for the very interoperability of our technology and of the internet. And the best way to do that is by engaging in transparent, multi-stakeholder conversations that have civil society, that have academics, that have industry as part of the design process so that we can ensure, ensure that we don't uh, hit any of those unintended consequences or that we don't overreach or that we don't do so in a way that plays into the types of agenda we're seeing uh, authoritarian states running. That's the strength of the way that we approach these issues. That's the strength of democracy, that we have open participatory conversations around this. And I think my message from our experience is that as any parliaments or policymakers look at this, um, it's important to not have these conversations in closed rooms. It's important to not have these conversations only within government, invite, the range of stakeholders into the conversation, let them help design this in a way that you can reap the benefits of digital connectivity without, uh, without uh, meeting or having so many of the costs that we're seeing uh, rife at the moment. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Anya. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Those are uh, really important inputs. And I think I know you were speaking from the perspective of the region, but I'm sure you would agree with me that this is very much reflective of the global nature of the issues we have. This is um, a very interesting region, Asia and Pacific. It's huge by surface, by population, and it's so diversified, including that we can speak from the perspective of stable developed economies, as we heard, fighting also issues, which may be also fought by Developing part of this region, uh, small island developing states are fighting specific challenges when it comes about the internet governance. Things are more expensive, harder to reach. And I'm very glad that we have one representative today sitting on my right side. Uh, so I would like us to stay in the region, stay with the governmental public sector and hear uh, specifically from um, Lefwali about the perspectives coming from Samoa and SIDS speaking about the issues that you specifically have in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Anja. Um, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and talo falava. It is indeed an honor for me to speak at this great forum where I believe it will be many to come and how it will shape the future of our region from a political perspective. Thank you for those who make it happen. And thank you for the invitation to be part of this and, and thank you for taking the lead.
Now, let me get straight into it by answering of the questions that we need to ask ourselves, as um, Andrea has uh, mentioned before. And um, I, I think the current situation in the region includes a complex lack of um, public trust um, regarding privacy, security, consumer and human rights protection. Some common concerns we observe, including, um, you know, privacy concerns where there is a growing concern among the public about how their personal data is being collected, used and shared by various digital platforms and services. High profile data breaches and scandals have eroded public trust in organizations' ability to protect their sensitive information. In the Pacific Island market, this is a huge concern, not only to us, Samoa, but across the border. We've seen, um, we've seen complaints about the diff different platforms, TikTok, um, Facebook, social media, and all that. But, and and that's, that's the biggest issue we have. There's no collective one solution. And, and it's, it's because it's a huge issue that we need to um, work together as partners um, to come up with a solution. Not only that, but we also have cybersecurity challenges. Um, the increasing frequency and sophistication of cyber attacks have um, highlighted vulnerabilities in digital systems and infrastructure, critical infrastructure, I should say. These attacks not only compromise individual privacy, but also disrupt critical services and erode public confidence in the overall security of digital spaces. Cybersecurity is a pretty new issue in the Pacific. And uh, although it was there for so long, um, it's a challenge for us in the Pacific region to um, uh, work on these kind of uh, cyber attacks. And that's why we're very thankful for um, forums like this to acknowledge um, the help of our partners. Um, I would like to acknowledge in particular the ambassador of cybersecurity for Australia. Um, Brendan, he came all the way to Samoa to talk to us, not only to Samoa, but the other Pacific Islands, to talk to us about the challenges we're facing, what we need them to help us on. And, um, and it was very rewarding when we arrived here on Sunday and I received an email that um, Brendan wants to have a meeting with us again um, on the first week of this forum. And we sat down and, and, and we spoke about um, you know, the, the many issues that we spoke about in Samoa. And for him to come up with a great news for us that they will be helping us in um, uh, trying to solve these issues, especially um, we're having a um, heads of Commonwealth countries meeting that will be held in Samoa next year in, in October. So that's part of the whole cybersecurity threat that we're facing at the moment, not only for us, but um, for the whole world that will be coming to Samoa. And, and that's why we're very thankful. We're very grateful for um, um, Brendan and the Australian government for the help, not only for the Australian government, but we also get help from the New Zealand government. And that's why during the uh, Pacific IGF, I, I did highlight the importance of being partners, of helping each other um, to combat these, these issues, these problems. And also one of the one of the concern, one of the challenge that um, we're facing in, in the Pacific um, and the current situation is of the misinformation and disinformation, as Brendan has already said. The spread of fake news, misinformation, disinformation has undermined trust in digital information sources. This has significant implications for public discourse and decision making. In Samoa itself, just after the election three years ago, where the government was changed by the majority of voters, after 40 years in power, it was hard for the then government to leave the offices. 
it was very hard. So people turned into um, fake pages to create fake pages and use it as medium to personal attack other people. And, you know, it was, families were divided. Societies were divided. The whole country was divided. And we were reaching out at the time. We were reaching out for help. And I have to admit that I recognize that it's not unique to Samoa. Every country has this problem. And so we are working um, with our partners to work on it, to make sure that the correct information is given to our people. I would like to talk about the challenges that, uh, you know, us as policy makers face to help shape a trustworthy digital space in the region. The main challenges that policy makers face is in shaping this region. Uh, first of all, the regulatory frameworks. Developing and implementing effective legislations and regulations that balance innovation, economic growth, and user rights is a delicate task. Strike, striking the right balance requires a deep understanding of evolving technologies and their society impacts. The absence of solution-based provisions is, in most legislation is a worry. I am specifically talking about the case of Samoa. The legislation, most of the legislation in Samoa are very old. And um, our own uh, Telecommunications Act 205 in my view, it's been you know long overdue. Um, but th the problem is this has to be this has to be initiated by the office of the attorney general. But I do also recognize that they also have a lot of other um, legislations to look at. So it's it's important that we have you know established frameworks that not only enable us to move forward but enable us to review them when we need to review them. The other thing, the other challenge is the international cooperation. Many digital challenges are transnational in nature, such as cross-border data flows and cybercrime. Policy makers need to collaborate more internationally to address these challenges effectively. One of the challenges is the technical understanding Digital technologies are complex and policymakers often lack the technical expertise to create well-informed regulations and policies. Therefore, involving IT experts in the development of policies and legislations is vital to ensure that security and privacy factors are correctly addressed in regulations for both the private and public sectors in order to comply. The need for having a pool of experts in one country is a must and one of many priorities. I spoke to um, a beautiful lady there on the understanding that um, she asked me what, what could be, what could be um, a major challenge in your country in terms of um, you know, internet governance and many other things. I said to her, the lack of human resources. It's, it's a huge concern to us because, you know, it's not that we don't have people to do it. We do have people, we send them overseas for scholarships. We pay for it, government pay for it. They came back to Samoa and recognized that, you know, they can do much better in terms of salary in other countries than in Samoa. So that's the challenge that we're trying to convince our, 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 our lawmakers about to, um, uh, you know, look at that because that's the root of all these problems that we're facing and government has to prioritize that. Um, also, we, um, we need to have more public engagement. Um, we need to get the trust of the people, the very people that we're serving, the very people that we come here to meet and get the ideas of how we're going to serve them. So it's important that uh, we get the involvement of, a public, of the public in the decision-making, um, especially in processes um, and policies. I believe that effectively engaging citizens is essential to ensure that uh, policies align 
with their expectations and needs. And I think that's all for now and we'll elaborate more later. Thank you, Anja. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for also expanding the, the, the narrative around we are setting today our discussion. Um, I'm very glad that uh, the infrastructure as a term was mentioned by both of our speakers coming from the public sector. And Joyce, you've been working in that domain primarily for, for years since I know you. So I would like you to ask just to maybe complement uh, what we've heard so far from the perspective of the Asia Pacific and especially from the technical uh, community perspective, what do you see as the biggest issues in the region around building trust in the digital environment? Thanks very much, Anya. And um, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I wanna also thank Anya from the Secretariat um, for inviting me to the session um, and also a warm welcome, especially to um, parliamentarians as well. Um, so I come from Singapore, which I was explaining to Lifali earlier, um, is an island that doesn't embrace island life, um, ironically. And I'm now based in Brisbane, uh, where the APNIC office is. And if some of you are not familiar with what APNIC is or means, it's the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. Um, I wear multiple hats, and, and so for this session, uh, I might need to put a different one on at you know, various points in time. Um, so obviously, I've mentioned APNIC. Uh, it's a regional internet registry. Uh, we allocate the, uh, and manage the IP addresses and autonomous system numbers in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, I'm also on the IGF MAG, which is really primarily my, um, where, where I'm sitting in this session today. Uh, representing the technical community. Um, and of course, I'm in the organizing committees of the Asia Pacific um, Regional IGF and also local IGFs. So I will be very happy to engage with you wearing any one or even all of my hats. Um, but, but for today, I, I want to frame my remarks around the fact that, as Anya mentioned, I think um, in, in her first remarks, that the Asia Pacific is incredibly diverse um, as you may expect, when it comes to hot issues in internet governance, there are bound to be competing interests. So for this session, I want to focus on common themes that are more universal and cross-cutting for, for the region. And we saw at the APRIGF, which took place just this week, that there were many vibrant and passionate discussions. I believe there were about 250 participants on site, which is great, um, and also quite a number joining us remotely. Um, we were very, very happy um, to have had the opportunity to also welcome NetThing, which is the local Australian IGF, and Pacific IGF to be held in conjunction with us. So APNIC is a very strong supporter of each of these internet governance processes since um, the very beginning. So at the IGF, as I'll come back to it, we are really trying to make sense you know, of universal rights right, and where they might relate to internet governance. There are lots of issues that you've heard um, from the speakers before me to do with issue, um, um, to do with access, connectivity, inclusion. Um, I want to add on gender and diversity. We also heard about security and privacy, um, emerging new and new technologies, and even content moderation and regulation. And these are topics that come out a lot as well at the IGF and at the respective national and regional initiatives. So I'll try to give a brief overview of those issues that are closer to the heart um, in this very diverse region. So for this region, I, I see that um, access and inclusion are intricately linked. It's quite difficult to talk about one in isolation without the other. Uh, we have 12 countries in the Asia Pacific that are least developed countries according to the UN, and three of which are from the Pacific. Um, there are many countries in this region that also have large rural uh, populations and communities. So there, there are strong and practical concerns around basic connectivity and bridging the digital divide. And, and of course, we also have to talk about affordability. This is something that people care very much about in this region. So the Pacific IGF held two days of discussions this week, and they were very much focused as well on these issues and trying to find practical solutions and ways to cooperate better. For this region, internet shutdowns are, is another issue that, you know, whether it's due to technical issues or otherwise, is also very prevalent. Um, I won't go into specific examples today, but it, it is something that I wanted to highlight, and I think that um, Ambassador Darling also did mention in his speech. So I've mentioned that Asia Pacific is very diverse. 
And in the IGF, this is also reflected. We celebrate and uphold diversity. Gender equality and safety of access affect everybody, everybody. The APNIC Foundation has a fantastic program called SWITCH. Um, it empowers women and um, the LGBTQIA plus community to take ownership of their career development in ICT and also provide opportunities to grow. Now, unfortunately for this region, and especially we hear every year at the APRIGF, um, there is always discussion about gender violence online. It's still very much present. Um, and I hope that we can find better solutions to this and, and try and bring things forward. Ambassador Dowling spoke very eloquently about the issues of cybersecurity and trust. Um, at the IGF, of course, we also have these discussions about how to build trust um, and confidence amongst citizens to use technologies and applications online. And I want to highlight as well um, the role of cyber norms to inform best practices so they don't work in um, isolation again. They are very much linked. What I will add is that in recent years, it's permeated our consciousness, I've observed in, in our con conversations, that security has to be balanced with privacy. So the EU GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, sort of sparked off a lot of thinking and discussion in that area. And consequently, what we see for this region is um, a flurry of data protection laws and cybersecurity laws, and very much strengthening in these areas. What I hope to see is that policymakers of both data protection and cybersecurity work together and inform each other rather than to develop in isolation. So communities from both these areas can really benefit from um, the intersection of topics. In Asia Pacific, there are many innovations and early adopters of emerging and new technologies. Um, however, we still see um, barriers to entry, you know, the availability of such technologies in certain countries. And I was privileged to participate in some of the sessions of the Asia Pacific Youth IGF. So there's the APR IGF, but there is also a youth component to the IGF. Um, and I was very struck by the conversations around the impact of emerging and new technologies on the future of work and employment. So people are curious you know, about new technologies and as humans, it's built into our DNA to be curious. Um, but because they are new, inev inevitably, we're going to talk about the ethical use of these technologies, you know, discrimination and bias, and of course, whether there is trust and accountability. So I think around the world, not just in this region, um, we are seeing a trend towards more regulation, um, not only on emerging technologies, of course, but also content moderation. Um, understandably, there has been great concern over misinformation, disinformation, um, Bifali also spoke about that um, um, at length earlier. And I expect that even new technologies such as chat GPT, you know, deep fakes, they're going to make the issue a lot worse. They will exacerbate this issue. So, but coming from the technical community, however, I, I do want to sort of say that our focus is mainly on ensuring the seamless connectivity of the internet. And this is where I, I'm also sort of addressing um, Anya. And your question earlier about you know, the technical community's take on these things is that we, we are tasked to ensure that the internet remains open, stable, and secure. And that means having an open and safe environment for people to connect and build their communities. So in a way, it is my gentle way of saying that you know, we, we also need to be moderate about content moderation. So by introducing these topics and their focus in this region, I hope I haven't given the impression that they should be dealt with in a pigeonhole manner. These topics are very much interconnected. Um, but also to draw your attention that the internet underpins all these issues, right? And, and really allows these areas of discussion to flourish. So the IGF 2023 is an opportunity for this region to gather and find ways to cooperate. I think it's been many years since we've had the opportunity to host an IGF in this region. And it's something that we really want to grasp that opportunity. Um, and, and I want to um, echo Lefali, you know, when, when she said you know, about the importance of partners and helping each other, I think that's, that's something that needs to be very much present um, in our discussions at the IGF. Um, it's also going to be an exercise for us you know, to discuss difficult issues and trying to find where the common ground is on many of these issues. 
Um, it is both a blessing and a curse, I think, um, that the IGF is not action oriented, as we've heard a lot in the past week, you know, should the IGF be more action oriented, what are the outcomes of the IGF, you know, beyond the key messages that the IGF produces every year, but I, I'd really like to say that it's it, the IGF as it is now does enable that freedom to think, you know, to, to discuss and, and to allow the community to choose the actions that might best fit to their purpose, right? Rather than to try and find a one size fits all solution. So there are different governance problems um, and, and obviously there should be uh, and should require different solutions. And finally, um, in closing, I, I want to now put on my APNIC hat. Um, and if you allow me to exploit the opportunity here at the session to mention the APNIC 56 conference that will be taking place in Kyoto in about two weeks uh, and where we will be celebrating our 30th birthday. We hope to celebrate it with all of you. Uh, you can join us in person and if not online, thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. So this is separate from the IGF in Kyoto. We're gonna go to Kyoto, come back and then go again to Kyoto. Absolutely, absolutely. Good, good. Thank you very much for setting, I think the scene with very rich content on a very complex and certainly broad topic. And I have a feeling that many of you will make it maybe even more complicated if you challenge some ideas or add maybe your experiences. So I do open the floor now and I invite comments and questions. Questions can come to the panelists, can come to the whole room, but I would like us to make a friendly warm dialogue on something that affects us all as we just heard from our panelists. While you are preparing your interventions, I already have uh, one request for um, intervention, and I especially would like to thank Member of Parliament coming from the Democratic Republic of the Congo from Kinshasa, Mr. Ion Bangira Safari Nashuti, that is online with us. So, uh, Mr. Nashuti, if you are in Kinshasa, then special thank you because I can imagine the ungodly time there. And uh, thank you for connecting with us. Um, you have the floor. We would like to hear from you, perspectives coming from the African region as well. How do they reflect on what we've heard so far from our panelists? So I don't see, uh, can you hear me or can you see me? Hello? I see you are unmuted, but we, are unable to hear you for now. I'll just give a couple of seconds to see maybe if we have some audio issue that can be quickly resolved. So uh, we can hear you now. Yes. Angira Safari from uh, from Congo in DRC. And uh, I'm very glad to be part of the meeting. Uh, just the issue of the time zone. We are not on same time zone. So here we are almost uh, 1, 2, 2 a.m. Uh, actually, I'm not in, in Kinshasa. I'm in Goma in the uh, eastern of DRC. Uh, so uh, being in, in Africa, especially in DRC, is not, uh, uh, not very uh, easy for us to to put on the table of the institution uh, topics like uh, internet governance uh, re uh, regarding the other issue we are facing like uh, like uh, uh, the security issue we have we have a problem of a of the security so the uh, the government are more concerned on the on things like a uh, uh, security and other things so uh, a putting on the table of the government or the, or the other institution, even the parliament topic like internet governance, is not easy. And myself, I I had to come uh, on on the discussion of uh, internet governance through a friend, a young friend from the social the social uh, the civil society, who. Uh, uh, added me in the loop, so I was able to, to take part to the IGF in Berlin in, two, in, in 2019. And from there, uh, I noticed that uh, as uh, Africa in general and the DRC, we have to 
we have to make effort to to join the other uh, and uh, contribute on the debate because internet is a is a powerful tool that can help us our country to to recover from uh, the uh, the time we are behind in terms of development but internet is a powerful tool that can can enable our country to jump and join uh, the developed country in terms of development of progress and we cannot um, just use a tool uh, that we are we don't know how it is managed how it is works and how how the gov how the governments of that tool the internet is done that's why i think is uh beside of uh, dealing with those big issues like uh, war peace we have also to in parallel also to be involved in this debate of internet governance and i think it's a good thing it's a good uh, strategy from the igf to make it um, a multi a multi uh what they say I'm not very strong in English. <laughs> I normally speak more French. I try to speak English, but to uh, to make that uh, the the discussion, the forum, the IGF involve uh, multi multi tech. Uh, what do you say? Uh, multi different person from different uh, uh, from the government, from the society, from the NGO, from tech. And from my side, it was more easy for me to uh, to join because first of all, I'm young, yes, and uh, I'm used to those tools. But I also have myself a background in IT, so it was more easy for me to understand uh, the internet itself. Now, as a MP, also to see the issue of governments of governance, how we can make sure that uh, we through uh, the law, through uh, other things, uh, through the the uh, the institution, we can build trust. We can build trust on internet, and and uh, for us, the major the major a uh, uh, concern is to is to uh, to see how we can how do, how we can uh, uh, recover the the gap. Because we are still behind, uh, we are still behind, and we have, we we don't have that kind of uh, uh, strong administration that can follow up uh, a, a, like this debate, which has make uh, which has taken many years, which have started since uh, 2006, I think, and but you know in our country when a government change. Not only the president, even if only the a minister change, all the projects are you have to start by zero. There's no any kind of continuity. So uh, it's very useful when you there is there is a a a forum like AGF when even if someone came and join after us, you will be able to to recover and to continue with us with you. But I'm very happy to be with uh, uh, Parliament from uh, Asia and Pacific region. In the uh, next uh, two weeks, we have also to to organize our own from for Africa region, and it will be a very good uh, occasion for us to exchange, first of all, between us African, and now to join you in. In, in in Kyoto with other colleagues from other region and see how we can we can also get some uh, brainstorming and uh, and get some good uh, practice from other primates how they 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 are working together with their government or with the NGO to to build that trust the trust on internet, the trust on on data, like the there's another issue. There's an issue. I was working on a, uh, on a, a policy uh, group on policy and network on AI, like the trust. How can we trust that 
something is really real or it was not uh, made by uh, AI, like pictures, video, even uh, some uh, some voices. We we should think about that one. And as uh, uh, a country as uh, DRC, we are we are still behind on that. Uh, uh, level of discussion because we have those uh, other shot I, as I say, we of uh, war and security, which are more critical for us. We, but we still uh, need also to give to give our input to make sure that the the internet that is being built, we are also part of it. We are not only the user of internet but we, we are also the contributor of the internet and the internet that will, will, will be there will be internet that will also be, uh, will be matching our, our interest, interest of our people, even if they are not, uh, uh, they are not really uh, aware about all those discussion because of the other issue, but at least, we, we we make sure that we try to get as much as as a, a possible input from our uh, our country and to to put it on the table so we can make sure that really the internet is we have one internet for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ayo Mangira, first of all, for joining at that hour, but also for very valuable inputs and for bringing up the concepts of uh, pressing digital divide. Unfortunately, that's a reality for our world, um, as well as um, lack of awareness with our current decision making mechanisms to um, make um, or resolve the issues that we see. Uh, I just want to see, I do see a couple of comments, uh, very interesting comments in the chat. So I'd like to see if somebody would like to take the floor uh, from Zoom or hear from the room. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I think it would be good also to hear perspectives coming specifically from the civil society uh, as the largest stakeholder group within the IGF and the one that in democratic society stands as a, as a corrective to um, to others. I don't see any uh, currently raised hands. I think we have one hand. Ah, yes, please, please, yes, take the floor. Take the floor yes. And then we'll go to Pio in Zoom. Consent. Thank you. The public is starting to get consent and at the same time uh, more disengaged. And that's the trust issue. It was that the correct impression I got. Thanks. So I want to speak to that. Uh, I have worked uh, in the capacity of a contractor, freelancer uh, in various organizations. And I never, uh, my role has never directly had to do with uh, governance. These are the areas of interest for me. So I have been a specialist or a technical person. And at the same time, uh, in the community, I also organize uh, community meetings and facilitate workshops as well. So that's my touch to the more technical community. And uh, I speak to a lot of people as well. And I uh, confirm what you're saying that as of trend past few years, where uh, I see that uh, people are more uh, aware of uh, the doorbell when it's connected to Wi-Fi or they, for the media at home, they come to our workshops. I see general public coming and they want to see if there's an open source thing that they can put it in the computer when they're sharing media. So I want to add a perspective uh, to that in my professional uh, experience. In 2014, uh, I signed up with IINET for my rental 
And uh, in the very first few days in my interaction as a customer, I sensed like uh, that there was something wrong in the way the technical things were handled as a customer. And a few weeks after that, there was a big leak, IONET, uh, username and passwords were leaked, a lot of information was leaked. So I'm referring to the concept of uh, weak signals in complex adaptive systems. In that case, it would be really hard for IINS to be able to pick up in, in the sense that I had and utilize it. But I think there is a possibility for uh, bigger co uh, corporations and government entities to tap into these weak signals from uh, people who come and work uh, in the organizations. In, um, I have personally had the experience of raising a consent as a contractor in the organization I've worked with, and um, uh, it was not taken and in some incidents, months later, issues happen. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who sensed it, but maybe where we can start is by, uh, from, from your perspective, being more proactive in uh, facilitating the flow of information where uh, it's not necessarily, I'm not in the, when, I'm, when it's not my job to point out security issues, it's difficult for me to follow that through. I can only make a comment and move on. So maybe if the organization is more proactive about identifying those and trying to facilitate that information to be amplified and find its, its way. Um, so this is more of an observation and a comment, but I would also like to hear if there is uh, something happening in that regard that if there's a, a framework or an organization that when next time someone comes to me and raises whether it's a, compl a complaint or suggestion, I can point them at that organization again, or it might be a process. Thank you. I think that that's really interesting observations and um, great comments in terms of how how we actually make those processes work in a, in a, in a way that's not just talking about having open engagement between government and the technical community or other stakeholders, but actually making it happen. I think my observation after many, many years working in government is that internet governance is uh, in many ways unique in terms of policy area for government. When you look at other elements of infrastructure that government has involvement with, uh, there's often a much smaller group of industry stakeholders and government stakeholders that are working to manage uh, how infrastructure is delivered, how it's governed, um, how it's uh, sort of regulated. Um, the internet is a really unique thing in the sense that there's such a broad community of people who make it work. I think we haven't been very good within government about appreciating how many stakeholders, how wide a community, how many varied perspectives there are in the community that need to be part of that internet governance uh, uh, conversation and how, need to be part of that security and safety in the digital domain uh, conversation, because it's just not the way we're sort of geared up around normal kind of uh, policy and regulatory issues, particularly with stakeholders not necessarily being inside our borders. So pinning down, here is a community of people need to be engaging with, uh, knowing that they are spread across the globe, that they come from many different perspectives uh, is, is really, I think, a challenging thing for all of us to get right. So I still think we're on that uh, journey, but I think we are getting better at it. We are getting better at that multi-stakeholder approach to actually formulating policy, to actually responding to the types of concerns that you have raised and doing so in a much more open and transparent way. So that's all to say, I think, I think you're right. We need to kind of structure in and embed those avenues for engagement. Uh, and we need to be less afraid from within government about having those types of channels that are open um, for anyone and everyone to engage with us. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of how we actually make that happen, you've got people like me where my role is to be out there talking to people like you and to get engaged in these conversations. Um, you'll have my details uh, after, after this, uh, there's an open door. You've got people like Richard and Ian from our communications department. Uh, this is what they do. They get out, they talk to stakeholders about internet governance and about what Australia 
uh, Australia's position is. You've got organisations like um, our eSafety Commission, which looks heavily at online safety issues, uh, our Cybersecurity Centre, which engages around cybersecurity issues. So there's a range of ways that you can interact and, and, and uh, be in contact with the Australian government, which I'm happy after this to uh, talk to you further about. But I think it is really crucial, and I think we do have a much better understanding of the need for that open uh, uh, lines of communication. Um, but it is something that is not necessarily in the DNA of how government operates and, and, and has required a bit of a shift in how we engage with the community. Thank you very much. Um, Joyce, you will remember as a MAG member when the IGF was a subject for intensive consultations to reform it to an extent by proposals from the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, we spoke about the concept of help desks. And your question reminded me, if something goes wrong, who do you call? And it seems that while we at the global level are still trying to understand how that idea could become maybe some, some sort of a reality, it seems that the shift goes back to the local levels, to the national levels, and that there are already some good practices there. So I want to maybe give floor to, to Joyce. I know you will comment also on this question as it's very close uh, to the work of the IGF, but also to your work with APNIC. Thanks very much. And I um, also wanted to follow up from Ambassador's remarks that um, I, I appreciate that you use the term multi-stakeholder approach. Um, a lot of people in the space would use multi-stakeholder model as if it is just the one thing um, without realizing that there can be many, many different models in that approach. And I think that's the beauty of sort of the system and the processes is that it's very flexible. And one of the most concrete examples would be the NRIs in the IGF, right? The national regional initiatives. They are all um, work autonomously. They do report back the activities to the IGF, but it's not a top-down thing. The IGF doesn't define for the NRIs how their work should be done, what they should talk about. It's very much bottom-up. It's very much decided by the communities that are formed and how they are formed, the rules of engagement are also very different across the different communities as well. And so when we talk about the multi-stakeholder approach, there isn't a one, one way of doing things. There are multiple ways of doing it. And even in the internet organizations ourselves, we have different, slightly different multi-stakeholder models from one another. Although you'll find that perhaps when you speak to someone from ICANN or from AP, they will say, we, we have the best model, of course. Um, but yes, I, I, so I'd like the way, the approach that we've talked about, which is the multi-stakeholder approach. It's really up to you and your community to, to define your rules of engagement um, and, and how you are going to come together to come to consensus and make decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. We have one, uh, we have one question in Zoom, then I'll come back to you if you don't mind. So Pure, please, you have the floor, then we're coming back to the room. Thank you, Anya, for giving me a floor, and uh, thank you, all speakers, for sharing your insight. Um, uh, this is Pure from the YCIG, your College on Internet Governance, and also representing the YGF Norma. Uh, I will put the very short uh, asking about my question. Uh, the first question will be the how the government from the developed country like Australia are collaborating with the government from the Angeles uh, and the developed least developed and developing country for addressing uh, really addressing related to the internet issue and also uh, and, uh, empowering them to get involved in the internet governance community uh, because uh, I. I, uh, based on uh, my limited knowledge and uh, based on my limited observation, I don't see many government uh, from the uh, least developing countries and the, the uh, developing country from the Asia, especially from the Asia Pacific regions are not very much engaging in the internet government uh, community. So, but maybe I don't know, so I'm here to ask about it. And another question is will be the, is there any GDG project uh, such as uh, infrastructure project uh, that are supporting to uh, these nation uh, in order to help them or support them uh, to, uh, to uh, for example, like collaborating 
for capacity building of the government official, or maybe the infrastructure building, like the center for the cybersecurity at the nation, uh, uh, kind of like that. That that question would be the: Is there any approach from the IGF map? Uh, any strategic approach uh, from the IGF map to reach out to this government to more get involved in the internet governance community? By in by raising say prices and also uh, engaging with the different uh, multi stakeholder in this community. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pio, for the questions. Um, I, I guess this will be directed to me. Um, so perhaps I'll take it in two parts. One on capacity building. Um, I, I'll put on my APNIC hat to say, um, as a regional internet registry. While our work is on allocating IP addresses and, and internet number resources, our core mission is actually really on internet development in the region. Um, so we do a lot of capacity building in this area and I won't belabor the point, but I do want to call back, I think it was Lifao Lee who said, um, talked about um, you know, how to develop professionals in the Pacific, especially, you know, and keeping, all that knowledge and expertise in the Pacific region, for example. And so, so APNIC doesn't just go out and do training. We also have train the trainer program. We do have a community trainer that is based in the Pacific, for example. Um, he, I think he spares his time between um, Samoa and Fiji um, and does help us with training in the region. And, and so we, we think of capacity building in, the, in, in more of a holistic manner. It's not just about going in and you know, providing that knowledge and then we leave. We really are very, very entrenched into you know, developing that expertise within that region for, for the region according to their needs. So that's what I would like to say about that. Um, on, on the IGF mag, the question, was it also around capacity building? I've kind of lost my train of thought. So what do we provide? Cooperation in the governments, exactly. So again, several layers, the, the MAG members themselves. So perhaps one thing I want to bring up is that we on the MAG um, do not represent our organizations or where we come from. We, we actually function as individuals. So if, if anything is, for example, myself, I, I am just representing the technical community when that makes sense, for example, in discussing the program. Um, but that doesn't stop us from bringing um, IGF, the key messages, the processes uh, to talk to our own governments or the governments that we may have contact with. Um, so that's one layer. But there's actually another layer, which is the IGF leadership panel that was just newly established. Well, not very, not very new now um, by this time. But um, one of their roles is to do outreach um, to governments, to... Um, have high level re representation to be able to do outreach on behalf of the IGF. That is part of their core mandate is to do that. Um, so yes, there is effort um, to, to do a lot of outreach work in this area, Pure, to answer your question. Um, I would say not so much in terms of actual practical cooperation, if that's what you're thinking about, um, in terms of real activities. But I do know for individual MAC members, for example, we do a lot of um, local work um, and work in the region, if that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pio will also address your question, I think, in the closing remarks by the panelists, because I, I will have a question on that note. So I'm going to ask you to wait. That's why I'm not asking the ambassador and uh, Lafoli to comment on this yet. But I want to go back to the room. So you said you would like to ask a question, please. Thanks, Anya, um, and very good morning to you. My name is uh, Bart Hogeveen. I'm working with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is a um, think tank based in, based in Canberra. Um, and over the many years, kind of, we've been working um, in, in our region, talking about, let's say, cybersecurity issues, but also the different means of governance. Um, and just kind of reflecting, let's say, on the broader topic of, of this, this session, and I think one of your, your opening lines, which is kind of, uh, where does kind of a regional perspective sit into kind of the broader IGF um, and, and whether we indeed see an increasing lack of public trust around privacy, security, consumer and human rights, I think as you stated at the very beginning. And I wonder, so I'm, I'm trying let's say, to package a few observations in a sort of question, um, whether 
our region kind of stands out, let's say, in contrast to, let's say, Europe or Africa or Latin America, in a way where generally we are fairly comfortable and confident with a level of government intervention kind of in the, in the technology and digital and internet space. Whether that's for, I think as uh, our friends from, uh, from Samoa mentioned, um, uh, protecting communities uh, from, from online harms, um, whether it's, for instance, in Australia, where uh, I think the ambassador mentioned uh, the Medibank and Optus Bank, where there is great comfort in governments stepping up uh, and going after the criminals, even if that, let's say, um, frightens quite a few even like-minded partners in other parts of the world, saying, where, where is Australia going with this? Uh, but it didn't spark a real debate inside in Australia, let alone in Parliament House. Um, or when you look at um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, where there is also great comfort in government taking uh, a relatively strong role in, in internet governance or even controlling the internet. So I wonder whether the proposition that there is an increasing lack of public trust is actually true and whether it's kind of this community, let's say the technical community, which is experiencing that uh, discomfort with, a, with an increasing public trust in government intervention and with governments um, also stepping up, let's say, that some of their intervention methods, whether that's through, I mean, probably irresponsible means uh, or, or responsible means, let's say, through, let's say, the, the legislation and regulation, which, which, can be, which, which, which can be defendable. So that's, I think, one thing I wanted to share. The other thing, and when you look, I think, about the, the role of parliaments or kind of civilian oversight, I think we're also in a situation in contrast to many other parts of the world where our parliaments and parliamentarians are largely, I think, followers of the debate uh, and of the agenda rather than shaping the debate or the narrative and the agenda. Just as an example, I think in a couple of weeks or maybe one or two months, we will be publishing a report, which is um, a survey of uh, knowledge and understanding on cybersecurity and technology issues amongst uh, the members of the Australian Parliament, both House of Representatives and Senate. Um, I think only 5% of members responded. Um, but if you look at their responses, it's almost one and one the same kind of narrative and same line that's been set by government. So I think we also have an issue of, let's say, parliamentarians um, being confident and comfortable in kind of shaping the narrative that they want for their constituents, for their public, um, rather than kind of following the line of governments in a way. Um, so, so those are kind of some of the, some of the observations in terms of whether the, even the framing of the debate here is actually correct, and whether it's mostly kind of the discomfort sits with us, this community, which sees that um, uh, the role of government, the role of parliament uh, in the technology and in the governance debate is becoming very much a reflection of kind of what's been happening kind of in the offline world and what's the state of the offline world when it comes to, let's say, the level of democracy, the level of civil uh, space, the level of freedom of expression, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And I think um, the perspective you put now on the table means that we would need one additional session to discuss that uh, concept is very valuable. And thank you very much. Uh, but unfortunately, we are um, running out of time and uh, blame it on me, please, that we are reducing the break. But I think there is a great value to stay a couple of more minutes in this room just to hear concluding remarks from our panelists. Uh, and on that note, um, certainly I would like you to reflect on everything that's been heard so far. I think we had uh, very good interventions coming from the floor. Um, but uh, I would like you to also focus a little bit on the concept of cooperation, because all three of you mentioned that in your introductory remarks. Uh, and I uh, maybe to start, maybe I'll start in a reverse order now. Uh, maybe we can start from Joyce. Joyce, you spoke about the need for working together between data protection law makers and cybersecurity lawmakers. Um, what's the role of other stakeholder groups um, when it comes about the work of legislators? I'm, I'm also going to try and, and build some comments into, you know, what Bart um, um, had asked and, and commented on as well. Um, 
I think the IGF especially is that gathering space for people with very different stakeholder group backgrounds to, to converse about issues, right? Um, and I think that is something that parliamentarians can best leverage when they're there, is, is to have that meeting of minds um, and to be able to meet exactly the subject matter experts that you would need that knowledge from in many different things. So, you know, Anya, you're asking me about cybersecurity and data protection and who else needs to be in the room? Well, really everybody, because the laws would affect everyone, all the citizens that are involved. So we're talking not just, you know, civil society, there's also um, contributions that can be made from um, the communities that develop the technologies for which those laws will have an impact on. We're also talking about users themselves who would have to think about their way of using those technologies and their role in things and understanding what their requirements are. And, and so I think that when we talk about, you know, multi-stakeholderism and the IGF, that that is where a lot of these conversations can take place because everybody's going to be there. So I'll close here by saying, you know, the IGF is a very welcoming, very friendly place. Um, I, and I do hear sometimes governments coming up to me to say, well, you know, are we going to talk about very controversial things? You know, is it, is it going to be uncomfortable? And I, I try to tell them, yes, we have individuals who are vocal about and passionate, you know, and passionately vocal, you know, about the things that they care about. But, but we want to have people who care about things at the IGF. That's, that's the good thing. Um, the other thing is that we always try and be a respectful place. We, we try and respect people's opinions on issues, right? And we also hold the tenet that every voice is equal or, or rather every, every person has the equal access to have a voice on, or an opinion on something. And, and that's something that we feel very strongly about as well. Um, and so regard the IGF as a safe space to really air out some of these issues that you otherwise would not be able to in other sort of more formal setting, right? And you have all these conversations in the corridors, you can have all these informal conversations with other experts. I think that's the beauty of the IGF is, is that gathering. So I'll close, I'll close it and I hope that that encourages um, those of you who, who might still be on the fence, you know, should I be in Kyoto for the IGF? To really think about that you know maybe you'd want to come and, and meet some of us yeah and we'd love to meet you thank you thank you very much joyce um Lafali, in your introductory remarks you spoke about uh, a really interesting word that i like um, you use the term partners uh, in um, in the way you interacted with different stakeholders here at the APR IGF, um, you also spoke about the cooperation that exists between the government of Australia and government of Samoa in supporting the digital capacity development building. And um, I want to ask you now about the value that you see of the coming to the IGF and how that can help maybe the country, especially in the context of digital capacity development. Thank you very much. That's, that's a very important question. And I would like to answer the question from the parliamentarian ITF relationship and partnership. Um, I, I see this as a very important uh, forum. Um, and, 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 you know, um, parliamentarians need to be informed of the technological issues that, um, that shaped our environment, that shaped how we grew up, that shaped how you know, our personalities that shape how our kids or children grow up differently from when we, we, we grew up ourselves. But it's important for me for um, the fact that um, um, this is a knowledge sharing platform that for me, it's very important because the ITF provides a platform for parliamentarians to learn about the latest developments the challenges and best practices in the digital space um, from all of you um, experts, policy makers, civil society representatives. They are the most important stakeholders of, of all these things that we're trying to discuss. And, and also the networking that um, this platform provide for the, the parliamentarians 
they can connect to the, their colleagues from other regions. And, and I would like to see more of the um, member of parliament's uh, presence. Um, or, you know, um, as, as Joyce has mentioned, maybe a little bit more of, um, of formal interaction um, of member of parliaments, um, you know, share their experiences and collaborate in common challenges. And it's very important for MPs to learn from each other and request help from each other when it's needed. Um, also, the policy insights, the participating of uh, parliamentarians in ITF sessions allow them to gain insights into innovative policy approaches um, that can inform, uh, you know, that inform them to make, you know, uh, legislative efforts um, effectively for different countries. This is very much needed for their own capacity and development. Uh, and also um, their advocacy for, um, you know, for, for the interest, for the interest of their people, for the interest of, um, you know, of their country, the success stories and, you know, challenges and, and you know, the, to, for them to highlight pressing issues that are facing uh, different countries. I mean, let's look at the Pacific, for example, climate change. You know, there, I haven't seen a much impact of um, discussion of internet governance on climate change. Surely there are, you know, aspects of it that, um, you know, that uh, we, need, we need to discuss and pay attention to. Um, so in terms of expectation from um, ITF, uh, I think parliamentarians will very much um, be able to identify solutions um, that will uh, take 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 back with them to their you know their countries, and the, the spirit of collaboration. You know, it's this is very important to me because I've, I grew up in a country that um, you know I, I can't do anything by myself. The Ministry of Communication can't work until unless unless I'm working with the Office of the Regulator. But, you know, there's a conflict there because the, the Office of the Regulator uh, has to be the monitoring enforcement side of, of the ICT sector. And the ministry is the policy arm. So there is a conflict there, but I have no choice but to work with them in, in, you know, in the spirit of partnership, in the spirit of working together. And of course, um, the enhancement of accountability uh, on the part of, uh, of the parliamentarians. You know, it will, um, they will be able to show their commitment to, uh, to being accountable and, and, and being transparent in shaping the digital future for, for, for one's country. So that's very important. So overall, I think the regional ITF serves a vital platform for parliamentarians to engage with global digital governance discussions. Um, that um, partnership is very important. We can learn from each other's experiences and contribute to building a trustworthy digital environment in their respective regions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I now would like to give the floor to the ambassadors. You are most welcome to reflect on the discussion so far, concepts of trust, comments that came from the floor. I especially would like you to reflect on the words that you've used when you spoke uh, in the opening saying that you are co-designing with industry laws like the new cybersecurity strategy and you use the word you know better than us so we need each other in terms of this cooperation so what's the value also of the IGF with that level of awareness on your side I didn't realize I'd said you know better than us uh, maybe I regret that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, and, and I think, Bart, your observations are really, really quite powerful in, in, in I think, the tension of policymaking uh, around the internet and what the future of internet governance looks like. I think the challenge for all of us is that the internet, as we know and love it, was built and run by a technical community operating outside of government uh, uh, kind of structures and institutions. And that's what's made it into the amazing piece of technology and infrastructure that we have today. And I think what we can't do is just hang on to the past of how it's worked and hang on and hope that we can preserve the 
early sort of decades of the internet's operation and the preeminent role of the technical community uh, to the exclusion of other stakeholders uh, like government. I think those times have passed because the internet has become arguably the single most important piece of, of, of infrastructure that the globe has. It also has become the means by which many transnational crimes are being committed every day in every country uh, on, this, on this globe. So whether I think it's, it's, it's desirable, whether it's, it's something that people are comfortable with, the fact is that governments are going to take a more activist and interventionist role in the governance of the internet uh, uh, for the future. I think the art of what we have to achieve as a community is how to do that in the right way that doesn't lead to the end of the, 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 the things that have been great about how the internet operates. One of the challenges for an Australian, for a government like Australia is that we are trying to carefully, sensibly, in a consultative way, address some of the harms that we have seen being perpetrated using infrastructure that, that uh, uh, is part of the internet. And we run the risk that the sort of arguments we mount about how important it is for there to be safety and security online can be co-opted, can be hijacked, can be repurposed by authoritarian governments to say, yes, of course, we agree with Australia, governments should take more control of the internet. And the end result of that, I think, is the end of the internet, the globally interoperable internet as we know it. I think what we see in some of the multilateral conversations, including at the UN, is some of the language that authoritarian governments use to exercise greater control of access to the internet, to exercise greater control over the interoperability and the flow of data over the internet, are finding their way into multilateral uh, conversations, are finding their way into language around exercises like the Global Digital Compact. And we have to be extremely careful that we don't get ourselves dragged down a path that for the right reasons and for responding to the community concerns, which it is a job of government to do, that we actually end up playing into some of those agendas, which would see the, the global internet fragmented into state-run, state-orchestrated, state-controlled, uh, uh, splintered uh, internets um, the world over. And I think there's, there is a real danger of that. So I think for us coming from the government community, it's really important that we're careful about how we tackle that. And it's really important that we focus on preserving what makes the internet work in the way that we love today, which is the technical interoperability. It is a multi-stakeholder approach and it is a consensus-based approach. And as, as you said, Anya, on many of these things, there is many people in the technical community who have been working around these issues for decades. And it is true, you do know better than us and we do need to be involved in deep conversations and do this in a uh, measured, careful, considered way, which doesn't, doesn't take us down the path of trying to hang on to uh, the past in a way that is not possible, but also doesn't play into the agenda of authoritarian governments uh, uh, globally that are looking for state-run, nationally-run um, mini internets the world over. There is no, there is no black and white sort of way to handle that. I think it's something that gets calibrated over time and can only be done effectively with forums like the IGF, with forums like regional gatherings like this, with what's coming up in Kyoto as well, um, globally, but being open to, we all have a shared interest here and there is a way we can all win, but there is also a bad scenario, which is by no means guaranteed uh, to not play out. So again, to wrap up, the importance of these conversations, this interaction and this back and forth is I think what's really crucial here. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much to our dear panelists. Thank you very much for the interventions coming from the floor through the Zoom. I think we've had a very rich discussion. I think Bart mentioned that 45% only responded to the survey you've done. I uh, contribute also inputs from the Secretariat to say that it's very challenging to engage members of Parliament from all the countries into the parliamentary track. 
which probably all together calls for all of us to invest even more in this parliamentary track. And I sincerely would like to thank you for supporting the parliamentary track. And I look forward to continuing these discussions in Kyoto in October. Mini break, then we're going into the second panel. Carlos, apologies, but this was very important to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much.